And I pray the Lord that you would bless us with ears to hear the message that you've given me to share with them. So we're looking forward to it. We're excited. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. So this is, as I said, the second Sunday sermon. This is number 18. That's amazing. I can't believe it's been a year and a half. I've been doing this every second Sunday. But as it is the second Sunday of the month, we'll move away from our verse-by-verse look at the Gospel of John and focus our attention on a topic. And this is, as I said, the 18th time we've done this. But then it's like, hmm, which topic? Because, you know, the Bible has an almost endless array of topics in it. It really does. It covers so much of life. So what should we look at? And as I mold it over, and (laughs) Sunday got closer, I got more nervous, and Another thought came to me, an even more important thought. Which topic does God want us to look at today? Thought, hey, let's include him. It's his church, isn't it? (laughs) I've mentioned that I'm the pastor here, but it's not my, for lack of a better word, my theater background. It's not my show. It's his thing. So I believe in prayer. I talked about it at the second Sunday sermon last month. So I thought I was praying. And as I was praying, I began thinking about the cross. The cross that our Lord and Savior was crucified on for our sins. And and as soon as I did that, God gave me lots of material. So I called this message cleverly, the cross. So what I want you to do is to, I don't, hopefully you have a few things in your Bible to mark uh, spots. I want you to mark uh, Numbers chapter 21, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, the fourth book of the Old Testament written by Moses. So Mark, uh, Numbers chapter 21, and when you get done with that, which you may not be yet, so I'll take time to get a drink. It's the new believers class teacher in me. I always wait till everybody's there. Okay, so if you mark that, then find kind of in the middle of your Bible, Psalm 22, and mark that one. So Numbers 21, then Psalm 22. And I need the Jeopardy music playing right now. Anyway, so, and then someone's going to sing it for me. Thank you. And then Isaiah 53, Isaiah chapter 53. So Numbers 21, Psalm 22, and then Isaiah number or chapter 53. But I discovered something I thought it was interesting. All four Gospels say it the exact same way. Matthew 27, 35, Mark 15, 25. All these are in your notes. Luke 23, 33, and John 19, verse 18. They all say the same three words in those verses. They crucified him. And that's all the detail we're given. They were very familiar with what crucifixion was. Now, speaking of the cross of Jesus, Oswald Chambers said, All heaven is interested in the cross of Christ. All hell is terribly afraid of it, while men are the only beings who more or less ignore its meaning. Kind of a sad state for us, isn't it? There was a pastor named Kyle McDaniel, and he said, The cross stands as the central message of Scripture and is itself a divine act of revelation. We see God most clearly through the lens of the cross. The cross reveals his sovereignty, the fact that he's God and we're not, his providence, benevolence, justice, power, holiness, mercy, glory, and victory. Any study of God, therefore, would be incomplete without a study of the cross, for it is there that God has made himself known. So the cross, of course, the cross is the centerpiece of the Bible. The Old Testament points forward to the cross. The New Testament points back to the cross. The cross of Christ, the fact that Jesus was nailed to a cross, died for our sins, and three days later rose from the dead, is the single most important event in all of human history, bar none. I mean, I think it's fascinating when, you know, football teams, (laughs) we shocked the world, we won. It's like, 
Do people in Zimbabwe even know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's so funny. The cross, which is the worst, the most torturous way to die that was ever devised by man. The cross was invented by the Persians approximately 400 to 300 BC. The numbers get smaller toward us in BC times. But it was perfected by the Romans. When the Romans crucified someone, they did it in a very public way. They did it in order to shame the victim and to scare other people who walked by and saw the victim on the cross. And the reason they did that was to keep them from committing the same crime the crucified person committed. It's why they nailed a sign on the cross above the victim. That sign stated why he was being crucified. And when the Romans crucified someone, they knew how to be sure that person suffered as much as possible for as long as possible. Now, the cross was so frightening to Roman citizens that the Roman senator Cicero said this, wretched is the loss of one man's, oh, excuse me, wretched is the loss of one's good name in the public courts. Wretched too, a monetary fine exacted from one's property. And wretched is exile. But still, in each calamity there is retained some trace of liberty. Even if death is set before us, we may die in freedom. But the executioner, the veiling of heads, and the very word cross, let them all be far removed, not only from the bodies of Roman citizens, but even from their thoughts, their eyes, and their ears. The results and suffering from these doings, as well as the situation, even the anticipation of the embattlement, and in the end, the mere mention of them are unworthy of a Roman citizen and a free man. Cicero went on to say that any thought of that type of death was the terror of the cross. Philippians 2.8, speaking of Jesus, says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. See, when Paul added that, even the death of the cross, that means that Jesus was so obedient, he was even willing to die on a cross, to die by crucifixion, which again, they understood very clearly what Paul was writing about. So why would I want to talk about such a subject? It sounds gruesome. It sounds bloody. It sounds torturous. It sounds, as Cicero said, just you're hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, all rolled into one monkey when you talk about the cross. You don't No. It's like you plug your ears and la, 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 la. That's what they're thinking. Well, believe, that, believe me when I tell you this. Part of me doesn't want to talk about this. Part of me would rather talk about grace. Isn't that nice? That's a, that's a clean topic. That's fun. That's nice. Yes, we've sinned, but guess what? God offers us sinners the gift of grace, forgiveness of all of our sins, past, present, future, and all we have to do to receive this wonderful, amazing gift is accept Jesus as our Savior and Lord, and we're good. That is true. But you know what? We wouldn't have grace available to us without the cross of Christ. It's just not there. It can't be offered. So, kind of a history lesson. The first mention of the cross is indirect, but it's clear that the cross is being discussed. And it's not in any of the scriptures I had you turn to, sorry. But the reference is in your notes. It's in Genesis chapter 3. And Adam and Eve have just sinned by eating the forbidden fruit. So God is now pronouncing judgment, and he gets down to the serpent. In verse 15, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is called the proto-evangelium. So what that means is the proto is like a prototype. Like you, you're an inventor, you come up with an idea. So you build a crude model and you take it to someone and say, hey, this is what I could manufacture on my own. Is there a way, as a prototype, you can actually put this into production and we could sell them? And they say, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Or they go, <laughs> no. You know, you don't know which it's going to be, but it's a prototype. Well, it's the first of its kind. This is the first mention 
again, this ties into why do we talk about sin so much? The first two chapters of the first book, people are sin-free. The entire rest of the Bible, we're dealing with sin. That's why we talk about sin a lot. We're still dealing with sin. (laughs) It's two chapters of the whole Bible. People are sin-free. So, anyway, obviously Satan bruised Jesus on the cross. But Jesus bruised Satan's head. And he will eventually cast him into the lake of fire for eternity. So the next mention of the cross is where we'll look at, if you want to turn to Numbers 22, or 21 rather, and we'll look at it starting in verse 4. And I looked at this a few months ago, I think it was last October, but I figure it's not quite recent enough to where you get bored with this. (laughs) If you get bored with anything from the Bible, you need to pray and ask God not to have you be bored. (laughs) But anyway, starting in verse 4, this is Moses and the children children of Israel, and as Steve Taylor said, the children of Israel and most of the adults. Um, Verse 4, then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread, manna that they're getting every day. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, oh, wait a minute, I skipped a verse, a very important verse. So after they said the worthless bread, verse six, so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. I don't think they were on fire. I think their bites were like, you ever get bitten or stung and it feels like you're burned? That's what he's talking about. Fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, "Um, Moses, we've sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, so that it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Any medical doctors here, does that sound like a treatment for a snake bite? To look at a statue of a snake? Probably not. It's not your typical way to get healed. But I have a slide that shows, this is a, a memorial on, um, in Jordan on Mount Nebo. And a lot of people believe that this is what they looked at, was a cross-shaped stick, basically the pole, and a brass serpent on it. The snake bites are a type of sin. And all we have to do, or a consequence of sin for certainly, all we have to do is look to the cross for our redemption and we receive it. We no longer have the eternal death penalty. It's a perfect picture of Jesus on the cross in the Old Testament. It's really cool. Now, why is the shape of this monument so important? Well, two scriptures, and they're both in the Gospel of John that we've been going through. The first one we've already gone over in John chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus is meeting with Nicodemus at night. And he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And then in John chapter 12, verse 32, and he said, Jesus again said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. So what lifting up is he talking about would draw, would draw all peoples to himself? The cross. Because all the wonderful things that he did while he was alive don't really affect us today, right? I mean, where, do we get our salvation from him feeding 15,000, 20,000 people with fish and loaves and walking on water and making blind people see, deaf people hear, raising some people from the dead? How does that affect us? But the cross, <laughs> the cross affects us greatly. Without that, we're lost. Now, I will tell you this. You can go to the next slide, I think. Yeah. So, I asked you to mark Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. Don't turn there yet. Because you guys are so good at that. It's great. I don't want you to turn there. I just wanted you to mark it so you could read them later. This is self-study time. They're about the crucifixion. 
Think of the terms of the crucifixion and what you know about it when you read those. Read them through the lens of someone standing at the foot of the cross and looking up and going, this is amazing. This was all written about way before it happened. They're all about that crucifixion, hundreds and hundreds of years before it happened. In fact, in Psalm 22, in that case, maybe a thousand years before Jesus lived, mentioning so many things that happened to him on the cross, and certainly at least 600 years before crucifixion was even invented by those Persians. But the next Old Testament scripture I want to look at, and I have the reference in your Bible, in your uh, bulletin notes, is uh, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, which reads in part, they will look on me whom they pierced. Certainly when one is crucified, they're pierced in at least four, maybe five places, right? One wrist, which actually would be probably here, because if you, if you thought about if they put a nail in your palm, like between the bones, what are these called, phalange muscles or bones or whatever, up here, and you put your body weight on there, what's it going to do? It's going to tear out. But if you put it here, it's a nice loop in the bone. And it goes right through. Plus, there's an ulnar nerve, which sends excruciating pain and probably locks your hand in the shape of a claw right away, immediately, as soon as they drive the nail in. But you can hang there, and you'll have minimal blood loss. So that's two points. And then his feet, they put one foot in front of the other and drive it through. Sometimes they put them on the side and run a, a spike through uh, by the uh, Achilles tendon. Either way, four wounds just from that. And then quite often they would make sure that the guy was dead by stabbing a spear in his side, which is what they did with Jesus. So they will look upon me whom they pierced. And this is twofold. One, there were Jews at the cross who looked at him when he was pierced, and there would be many people, there, all, all the people who lived on the planet will one day look upon him whom was, who was pierced on the day of judgment, whether it's the day of judgment of rewards for believers or the day of judgment for condemnation for non-believers. So that right there, I think is fascinating. Many Jews did that, and many people in the future will too. But as the infomercials say, but wait, there's more. <laughs> in numerous places in both the Old and New Testaments, God referred to himself as the first and the last, right? Anybody agree with that? Anybody heard that? Okay. So I want to make sure. Is this on? Okay, good. In the New Testament, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus himself said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. And this is how we know for sure it's Jesus. Not only is he appearing to John in chapter 1, but then he says, who is and who was and who is to come. Who is and was, you know, who was here before. Was it the Holy Spirit? No. Not that he wasn't here, but is the Holy, are we waiting for the second coming of the Holy Spirit, who was and is and is to come? We're not waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. He's already here now. We're not waiting for the Father. He's the one that has the plan. We're waiting for Jesus. So he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, who was and who is and who is to come. And but wait, there's more. The Almighty. Some people think Jesus is kind of a second-rate God. God the Father was there, created Jesus. No, that's not biblical. Jesus did the creating. He's always been, always has been, always will be. And he is almighty God. And Jesus had just revealed himself to John. So that's Jesus actually talking about himself. So now the next slide is an interesting one. It's going to look like I just took a Sharpie and scribbled to a lot of you. Um, on the top row in the upper right-hand corner to us is a thing that looks kind of like a, a stylized X. And next to it on the right or on the, on, on the left. The right is the X, and on the left is what looks kind of like a letter N in cursive. You know what cursive is if you don't? It's not when you hit yourself with a hammer and you say something you shouldn't. It's a type of writing that some of you youngins may not know about. I don't know. They're not teaching it to you. But here's a fascinating thing. Hebrew reads right to left. My wife and I had the privilege of going to New York City with our daughter, and we were watching, there are certainly many cultures represented in that big city, and there was a, a woman, she was Jewish, <laughs> it was so cool. She paid for something with a credit card, and she signed, and she went right to left. And I was like, 
she wrote that backwards. And, she, and t- then I thought, no, she wrote it frontwards for her because right to left is how they write, how they sign. So the one on our right in the upper right-hand corner is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's called the Aleph. And then the next one to the our left, right to left, is called the Tau. So the Aleph and the Tau and then down below, you may remember or recognize these symbols a little more. They're Greek, and they read left to right, the alpha and the omega. So you have the, the aleph and the tau and the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. The Old Testament version on the top, the New Testament version on the bottom. Now, Chuck Missler, he's gone. He's with the Lord. But man, this guy had like 19 people's worth of brains in his head. <laughs> this guy was, <laughs> if you ever want to have an amazing study, find his book on book of Revelation study. And his homework will be, oh, before you come back next time, read the book of Isaiah. It's 66 chapters. It's a mini Bible. I mean, it's, it's like, how long do I have? Do I have a couple of months? See you next week. <laughs> anyway. He had an amazing mind. Well, this is what he said. In the Old Testament, we frequently encounter the letters Aleph and Tau, the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. There are instances, however, where Aleph Tau is used as a pronoun. Now, this may get beyond some of us to indicate the second person masculine singular. For example, in Zechariah 12.10, we find the prophecy of the Messiah's climactic appearance to Israel. They will look on me whom they pierced. When Jesus comes back, they will see him whom they pierced. So I have a slide that it's from an inter, what's a a Hebrew interlinear Bible. And I'm only showing you this slide and this size to point out at the top, you can see clearly Zechariah and then 1210 in that red bracket. And we're going to look at the section there. But the next slide is that slide expanded, zoomed in. So the way this interlinear works, remember Hebrew reads what? Right to left. So it's totally backwards. So what's weird is that the Hebrew word is in the middle there, the black. But then below it, we see English and we read that left to right. And then we go to the left and read left to right. So it's, bear with me. So that first Hebrew word on the right to us is then they will look. You see that up there? And then the next one is a word on me. So then they will look on me. Then you see the Aleph and the Tau. Where's the English underneath it? There isn't any. It's not there. It's not translated. Then, and that's not a mistake. It's just the way it's it's done. So the next word, Hebrew word, whom, and then the last one, they pierced. All this will make sense here. Chuck said, the way it could be read is, and they shall look upon me, Aleph, Tau, whom they pierced. That's reading in Zechariah 12.10, reading that out loud. The untranslated Aleph Tau could be translated as follows. And they shall look upon me, comma, the Aleph and the Tau, comma, whom they pierced. Or, making it English even more, they will look upon me, the first and the last, whom they pierced. Now, some people will say, because it's that thing that's used to indicate the second person of the masculine singular, which I don't disagree with. God, when he created Hebrew for the Jews to speak, didn't intend for that to be read out loud. It's written so you understand it's a grammatical thing. You don't translate, you don't read it. But you know, I say this, they're still there. (laughs) And I don't think God makes mistakes. And I don't think we're making a mistake by not translating it. But I think God put them there to identify the one whom they pierced as none other than Jesus Christ. We know it's true anyway, right? So it fits. And it says in Revelation, Jesus Christ is the Almighty. He's the first and the last. And here it is in the Old Testament. And you know what's fascinating to me? This same Aleph Tau is in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Gen, uh, John chapter 1 says, who did the creating? You guys remember? Are you students enough? Jesus did it, right? He created all things, and without him, nothing was made that was made. You ready to have your mind blown? Aleph and the Tau goes, in the beginning, God, the Aleph and Tau, the first and the last, created the heavens and the earth. 
Do you understand what that's saying? (laughs) In the Old Testament, it's saying Jesus made everything. I just love that. I agree with Jeff. He's in the back row. He said, wow. (laughs) It's an amazing thing. To me, it really is. It's another example, and it ties in with the crucifixion of Jesus, whom they pierced. It's mentioned in the Old Testament. Okay, you can move on to the next slide. So in the New Testament now, Paul the Apostle was one of the most educated Jews of his time. He stuttered, stuttered, you might have stuttered, I stutter sometimes, or he studied under Gamaliel, who was the the great Jewish Pharisee. The teacher of teachers was Gamaliel, and he taught Paul. However, after Paul got converted to Christianity, he wrote eventually the majority of the New Testament. Paul had gained a lot of education in his life, but he wrote this to the Christians in Philippi, in Philippians 3.8, and this whole verse I put in your notes, yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So in other words, Paul said, all this stuff I've learned, It's nothing compared to just knowing Jesus and knowing about him. And now as far as what Paul did know, Paul wrote this. I think it's fascinating too, to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 2, chapter chapter 2, verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. (laughs) Paul had a great education. He probably had a greater understanding of the Old Testament than anybody else in his time, certainly anybody else in the Christian church. Yet he said, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's how important the cross of Christ was to Paul, who God trusted to write most of our New Testament. I think it should be a little important to us. We should understand it, get a grasp on it, and uh, certainly, wow, appreciate it. Paul also knew that not everyone believed as he did. To the same church in Corinth earlier in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So that's why the cross is so important. Paul believed it to be the most important historical and spiritual event a person can have knowledge of, a person can believe in, and a person can trust in the power of the cross. But you know what? Each one of us has to recognize our own personal deep need for the cross. Now, this is a question I'm just going to throw out there. Have you ever thought about blaming someone for the crucifixion of Jesus? When Mel Gibson made his movie, The uh, Passion of the Christ, and I don't know if you've seen it or not, if you have, you know what I'm talking about. It's a pretty brutal movie. As one reviewer said, for Christians, it'll be like watching a family member being tortured for two hours. It was just awful. But he didn't go as far as the scriptures do on what happened to Jesus. And when Jesus was on trial with Pilate and the Jews were standing below, one of the, I think it's supposed to be Caiaphas, but he says something and they don't translate it with subtitles. But what he says is, he's like, hey, you don't want to crucify him, he's innocent. And then he says, let his blood be on us and on our children and our children's children. In other words, we'll take the blame. And and there, someone asked him, I think it was his brother, Mel Gibson's brother, why didn't you talk about that? Why didn't you put those things. And he says, are you kidding me? The Jews are going to want to crucify me after seeing this movie, let alone that, because they'll be blamed. And they're, But it's what the Bible says. But do we blame the Jews? Well, did the Jews whip Jesus? Did the Jews torture him? Did the Jews put a crown of thorns on him? Did the Jews mock him? Did the Jews spit on him? Did the Jews drive the spikes in him? The spear in his sight? No. Who did that? The Romans. I know for the Jews, it's anti-Semitism. I don't know if there's an anti-Italianism or whatever, but isn't there, is there a prejudice against the Romans for doing that? 
don't blame the Romans, don't blame the Jews. If you want to blame someone, you don't have to look any farther than looking in a mirror. Being honest, it's true. Someone asked Mel Gibson, they, and I love this. They said, do you, who, who, who do you blame? And he said, it was, it was me. I did it. It's because of my sin. I think of the second verse of this song, and we've sung it here many times, how deep the Father's love for us. And I'm going to try to get through this. It's very emotional. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. John Stott summed this up really well. He said, before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. Okay, so another question. Did Jesus know about his cross ahead of time? Was there a way he could have gotten it? I mean, because, I mean, he, he should have seen it coming. He's Jesus. He's God in the flesh. Isn't there a way you can kind of avoid it? Well, Matthew 26, verse 2, Jesus said, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Sounds to me like he knew what was coming. It was very clear. In fact, he knew he came to die on a cross. Do you know that Jesus Christ was not murdered? He was sacrificed for us in our place. Jesus said in John 10, verses 17 and 18, Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me. Not the Romans, not the Jews, not us. But I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. And this command I have received from my Father. But you know, Jesus even knew about the cross long before that. Revelation 13, verse 8. Now, in context, it's talking about the beast, the one that we call the Antichrist, but it mentions a fascinating aspect of the cross of Jesus Christ. It says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, worship the beast, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, here it comes, slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus knew about the cross before he created the planet, before he created us. He knew he would have to come and die. Nothing about it surprised him. And as for the Father, couldn't he have stopped it? 1 John 4, verse 10. And I will interject, yes, he could have. He could just say, you know, it's not worth it. Look at them. We're not worth it. But he didn't say that. This is from the NIV. This is love. That's why he didn't stop Jesus. This is love. Not that we love God. <laughs> We'd like to take credit for that, wouldn't we? Well, of course he saved me. I mean, look. Ta-da! Have no fear. Handsome's here. <laughs> and people are like, whatever, dude. You know. <laughs> but this is love. Not that we love God. It's not that. So just take that out of your brain. It's not because we love God so much, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, the word atoning sacrifice, those two in English, in the New King James and the Old King James, it uses a fancy word, propitiation. It's like, whoa, what does that mean? It means the means of appeasing, appeasing God and his wrath against sin. It's a means whereby sin is covered and remitted, forgiven. That's why I call the cross the wonderful cross. That's why I had this made and I wear it around my neck pretty much all the time. I had to take it off when I got a chest x-ray a couple of weeks ago when I was sick. And it was not easy because the clasp kept coming undone. So the jeweler just took it, the clasp off and 
soldered the links together, and it's just barely bigger. So don't talk good about me, or I'll never be able to get it on and off anymore. <laughs> You're like, that wasn't going to happen anyway. So, but it's the wonderful cross. Now, how did Jesus feel about this cross? Because I haven't gone into a lot of detail on what happens, and I don't think that was the purpose of this message. But it was horrific. How did he feel about it? Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So he came up with the design, he came up with the idea, and then he carried it out and completed it and triumphed. The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and then he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Wait a minute. He knew the cross was coming, and when it happened, he was like, Yay! <laughs> I can't wait. He had joy in his heart to go to that cross and be tortured in our place. So, what was the joy? It's not a what, it's who. And I can steal a line from Sound of Music. You and you and you <laughs> and me. <laughs> it's, it's every person who would believe. In fact, it's even people who don't believe in him. He did it for them anyway. It's just up to them to accept it. He did it for us. And that put joy in his heart. He was so excited because he knew what it would accomplish. So what is the ultimate result of the cross? There's a verse that just blows me away every time I read it. It's in the book of Jude, who was a brother of Jesus. And it does, it's just one chapter. So does he, I guess you could say chapter one. That's the only one there is. But it's verse 24. And it's speaking of Jesus. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, which I love right there. He is able to keep us from stumbling if we allow him. He will give us the way out when we're tempted. But he also, and to present you faultless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. There's that joy again. But did you miss that? Because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, our salvation, if we believe in him, he will one day present us faultless before God his Father. Um, anybody here feel faultless? <laughs> I don't. I know what I've done, and I'm not going to tell you. Um, but <laughs> I've had many conversations with the one who matters, <laughs> Jesus. But you know what? I know what I've done. You know what you've done. And Jesus knows what all of us has done. Faultless means morally, without blemish, faultless, unblameable. So, again, I don't understand. I know what I've done. I did it. But it doesn't say that he presents us innocent. He presents us faultless. He knows what we've done. He just doesn't hold it against us. Satan does it all the time. He's constantly, oh man, you, you call him a pastor? Chris, look, look what he's done. He's done this, 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 this. He presents his case, so to speak, in the court of heaven. And our defense attorney, Jesus, looks at the judge and says, what do you think, Dad? <laughs> he's covered by the blood. Case dismissed. It's fascinating. He doesn't hold our sin against us because the Father held it against Jesus when he was on that cross, when he was dying, when he was suffering. His second to the last statement, three words, it is finished, to tell us die in the Greek, paid in full. That is why we talk about the cross. That is why we love the cross because of what it accomplished, because Jesus went there willingly with joy in his heart. And you know, it's all summed up in one word, and that's grace. I'm not sure who said this. I tried to find out, but it's really good. 
So I'm going to say it anyway, but don't credit me with it, other than the fact that I copied it and I'm going to read it to you. The doctrine of grace may be the hardest doctrine in the Bible to accept. It's not that grace is hard to understand. No, we know what the word means. Our problem comes in the application. Grace asks us to accept two things that we don't want to accept. One, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. So get that out of your brain. That's gone. You can't be good enough. You can't scrub yourself enough. You can't get rid of your sin. It's a crimson red stain. But the second one is if God doesn't save us, we will never be saved. So God did. I love that. Do you guys remember the old MasterCard commercials? They recently revived them. They'd they'd tell you how much individual things cost. And then they would say the result of buying those is priceless. And then how wonderful it was to have a MasterCard and probably solve all your life's problems. Well, about 19 years ago, I wrote this parody of those MasterCard commercials. Three seven-inch nails, $12. Two roughs on timbers, $75. Crown made of thorns, $14. Blood spilled to purchase your salvation, priceless. Most things money can buy, but for everything else, there's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the master of possibilities. That is the power. That is the reason to love the cross, to know about the cross, to come to the cross, to come to it and ask for forgiveness. Jesus nailed all the counts against us to the cross and made a public spectacle like, there they are. They're all taken care of. So don't hate it. Don't be ashamed of it. Jesus wasn't ashamed to go because he knew it would save you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the cross. (laughs) Oh man, thank you for your love. Jesus, we thank you for having joy in your heart and you will one day Present us to the Father, faultless, because of what you've done. And in that moment, sometime in there, mixes in the fact that we become, our sin nature is taken away. We are incapable of it from that point on. And seeing you and being sinless and having a new body, mine's wearing out. I'm looking forward to that. You truly are amazing. And Lord, this is the reason why we want more people to know about you. So we pray for the success that we believe is coming with this Harvest Crusade. It's not that Greg is going to say anything that none of us has said. It's just that you use that setting to reach people. So I pray, Lord, that this wonderful message of the cross would inspire us to want to share it with other people, to let them know how wonderful and amazing you are. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.